Now, Hans, Hans has, as, as I told you, he, he became quite famous. Uh, the, the, the big problem that Hans has had to face was that, as an Austrian, uh, he was driving during World War II, and after World War II, no, nobody would, would have his uh, films or, or, or books, except in German-speaking countries. Uh, and that is where Jacques Cousseau was a, a little bit luckier. But he was a great talent. He passed away just a few years ago. I've met the guy two times. And uh, he had one trump card that was his wife, Lotte, meet, meet Lotte, a beautiful lady, and she features in all his underwater films. But he was a shark specialist, and he was the first person to tell everybody, sharks aren't that bad. And he went diving and, and, and filmmaking in the Red Sea and in Australia, and in Australia he said, where can I see sharks? He said, you don't want to dive with sharks? Are you completely crazy? And I know what I'm doing. And, and he did. I mean, he dived for years with sharks, studied them, and never got into, into trouble. And I don't know how many scuba divers are around this room, but have you ever seen someone in trouble with sharks? I haven't. <laughs> sharks are nice. People tend to be dangerous. Yeah. Now, he was the first non-biologist who made a major contribution to underwater photography. Uh, another Frenchman, uh, Russian origin this time, and Dmitry Rebikov uh, constructed the world's first um, electronic underwater strobes. This is the first one. It was called La Baleine, the whale, because it was so huge. I mean, nowadays you have these small strobes, right? Or incorporated into your uh, into your uh, tiny cameras. This one weighed, I think, 40 kilograms, and it was housed, as was done very often in the time, in the plexiglass housing, homemade. And the plexiglass housing during one night dive flooded, and the condensers charged to 10,000 volt. They discharged and made a spectacular underwater flash, but that was the last one of this, uh, <laughs> of this time. And then he constructed more uh, compact ones, and of course, I, I have, I'm still of the generation, I started diving, scuba diving 58 years ago, yes, I'm an old man, uh, and uh, I have still taken lots of pictures with flash bulbs, but nowadays everybody works with Levikov's invention underwater electronic strobes. Here are some more of uh, Levikov's uh, <coughs> gears. This is a very compact camera. There is a compact camera here. And this is an electronic flash which flashes to the side to give a side lighting to what you see. And now we come to another major contributor to underwater photography, no biologist. Belgian inventor, first he invented some airplanes and then he got bankrupt and then Cousteau asked him, can you build me a watertight camera that doesn't need a housing? And he built the thing that you can see on the right, the Calypsophot, and the Calypsophot was the predecessor of the Nikonos, which some of you might have known. And now we get to another chapter of underwater photography, to the left is me. Um, <laughs> And at, so now I'm looking a little bit less ugly, I, I have been spare fishing a lot, uh, which is something that, of course, I don't advocate anymore. But we are back in 1961. I have plundered the sea. I have taken out shells. I have hunted fish and even octopus, poor thing. And uh, what, what young people like you don't realize is that ecology in the sense of protecting the environment is a very new concept. In 1962, that's one year later than the left picture, Rachel Carson published Silent Spring, a famous book and the first one to raise awareness among us normal uh, mortals that maybe there is something wrong with what people are doing to nature. 1962. That was the great period of DDT to fight uh, insects and plagues. And she said, if we go on, DDT will accumulate at the end of the food chain, mm -hmm. and the birds who are eating the insects who have eaten uh, fruit or, 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 or flowers 
the DDT is going to accumulate and the birds are going to die. And one day we will have a silent spring because there will be no birds anymore to sing. That was the message. So pre-1962, nobody worried about the environment. Post-1962, few people had read Rachel, read, read Rachel Carson's books. It took some time, but then in the 1970s, you get Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, and they made a lot of publicity about these issues. And slowly and gradually, and I think you are the living proof, one gets more and more involved with protecting the environment. Now, I myself slowly switch from spare fishing to taking underwater pictures. This is my first, 1960. Gosh, I'm getting old. And I took that picture with this gear, a plastic bag with a rubber glove inserted inside the camera behind uh, a porthole and attached to it, but you cannot see it on this picture, of course, a flash bulb reflector. Now we move on. Some 20 years, I have become a marine biologist and I use photography for some of the work that I'm doing. Here I am working on the Caribbean reef in Puerto Rico and I am taking pictures of these square meters. All in all 100 squares that I took pictures of in black and white on color slide film and that I made an inventory of uh, diving and just writing down what and making a sketch what was inside each square. All that so here you have one square and then, then, then another one and they were all assembled together by hand. There was no other means to do it in those days. And the end result is a photo mosaic of 100 square meters of reef and then a detailed map of the reef where each species was drawn. And that was the only way to know objectively and surely what was on that, those hundred square meters of reef. And I use this, so now I'm using photography as a tool for biologists. I use this to compare different coral reef survey methods. Because back in 1980 there were about seven methods that were used and the Australians said our method is the best and the British said our method is the best and the French said our method and the Germans and so I said how can you say that your method is the best? So, I knew objectively what was on that reef, no question about it, and then I allowed myself two 45 minutes dive on this reef for each method. So which method got the best result closest to what was there objectively uh, in two dives of 45 minutes? So there is a little bit worry about time because you can get an excellent coral survey by this method but that's rather a lot of work and it's very time consuming and not, not very easy. So I used those seven methods that were widely used in those days and I came out with one method that was better than, than the others and uh, one method that was really worse than, than all the others combined. So that was what I used for Torif. And then a little bit later on, I went back to work in the Mediterranean from the laboratory where Louis Bouton made the first underwater pictures. And I used photography to monitor recolonizing of a given underwater surface, half a square meter, I think 70 by 100 or something like that, 70 by 90 centimeters. And uh, we cleaned those surfaces perfectly with hammer, chisel, uh, metal brush, etc. So it was bare rock and we planted two screws in the, in the bottom and this frame would fit snugly on those two screws. So we knew that we were getting back to the same surface exactly and photographed it over time. This is what the rock, this is one station, we did it in several different stations. This is what the rock looked like after cleaning and what you can see, 07A, that is the name of the station, and 2408, 
4 means 24 uh, August 84. And those were stuck with uh, scratch on that plate within the frame. And then, so this is 1984. This is one year later. You can see uh, calcareous algae coming in, it's the pink things. You can see some uh, sponges, yellowish. This is a coral. There are barnacles there. So it starts being colonized. This is after one year. This is after two years. Um, lots, it's almost entirely covered now by the calcareous algae, uh, which of course the sea urchins graze upon, they like it. And the, there are sponges and also uh, colonial sea scores. And then we are one more year later, the colonial sea score is getting much more important. And we are another year later. And so this gave us a fair idea of succession. But what I had hoped for, sorry, what I had hoped for was that we could really follow the, follow the dynamics of what was going on. And I was still working, teaching in, in, in school in those days. So I only had my school holidays to go there. And the time between two holidays was too long. So yes, it had changed. But in what way, who had overgrown whom, I couldn't tell. This has never led to any publication, unfortunately. And then we get much more closer to today. I was invited by the Natural History Museum of Paris to come with them to Europa Island. It's in the Mozambique Channel between Madagascar and the African mainland. And they were going to do coral sampling there. It's an untouched part of, of the ocean. Uh, no towns uh, nearby. The nearest town is about 100 miles away. Uh, no uh, divers, because it's forbidden to go there. It's French military territory. So you really have to get a special permit. So this is a pristine reef. <coughs> Lots of sharks around. No sweat. Um, <coughs> So, prior to the coral sample, each coral sample got, of course, a number by which it was registered by the biologists of the museum. And my task was to document, this is the col colony number 89. Then they would get a pretty picture of the colony as a whole, and a pretty picture of a detail of the colony still alive. Because once it was pickled, of course, they, they don't look that nice anymore. And while I was doing that, of course, hey, here's a nice shark. So, well, I go and take a picture of the shark. And, oh, that's a nice sea urchin. I take a picture of the sea urchin. Hey, that's a nice clownfish. I take a picture of the clownfish. And then I saw these hydroids. And never seen hydroids like that. But, OK, nice. And you can, you can easily recognize the typical hydroid disposition with the polyps on either side of the, of the branches. And uh, at least that is what I thought I was taking pictures of. But then, when I looked on my computer screen in the evening, I recognized that, blimey, this is an octocoral. And I'm an octocoral specialist, okay? My PhD was an octocoral. <laughs> I didn't recognize this as being an octocoral. It's the tiniest gorgonian you've ever seen. They grow to seven centimeters. That's adult size. There were <coughs> thousands of them. It's as far as we know now, it has never been found elsewhere, but maybe, maybe they are here in, in, in uh, Singapore Harbor, I don't know. Um, so we gave it the name Insla, the Europensis, from, from the island of Europa. And that's, that's the smallest growing Orient that has ever been described. Photography, I wouldn't have known it without. And then the reason that I am here, uh, as Kerry told you, is I'm working on a new field guide. I've written quite a few for French diving enthusiasts. And here I'm working on my field guide of the Mediterranean Sea. You uh, have a Syrian there to the left, a grouper to the right, and, well, another hard day in the office. <coughs> this is this is, this is one of my animals. This is a real Gorgonian from the Mediterranean Sea. You see Mediterranean, can be quite colorful, it's nice. And 
Well, that's about it, the story of underwater photography, my story with underwater photography, and since you still haven't uh, run out of this place, <laughs> I'll give you some ideas, mine, uh, about taking good underwater pictures. Everything I'm telling is worth for above water as well. Um, I must admit that I, I became a biologist almost by accident because I could have chosen to become a graphical artist. I didn't know what, which way I would go. So now I put some art into the science and diagonals guys always work. Um, it's nice when you have an idea of something going like that rather than like this or like this. Look at this for instance. I mean, this is nothing. It's just a bit of water and a bit of rock. Well, reef actually. Um, there's not much, but the diagonal puts some um, dynamism in it. Here we are in the wreck of the Umbria and the Red Sea. Up front is Marc Xavier swimming. And you know what? This is something you cannot do on land, but underwater you can do everything you want because people won't notice. You can tilt your camera to get that diagonal. It's not for pity. I mean, it works. Maybe not for an underwater field guide when you really want to show things as they are. But if you want just to take nice pictures, who cares? <laughs> Same for this lizard fish. You see how, how nice they are. Here you have two that. Well, that's the body, that's the fins. Or a sea pen. Or just a few little squid. Or even the rays of the fin of a scorpion fish. or the tail of a lionfish. We are not talking biology anymore, we are taking art. <laughs> well, that's a little bit pretentious. We are, we are talking pretty pictures, hopefully. Or a clam oyster, what do you call it? Thorny oyster, that's the name in English. Or a fungia coral, you know, the, the big monopolyp corals. Or trunkfish. Yes, diagonals work. But then, forget everything I just said. Let's try to be symmetrical. And when you are symmetrical, you are either horizontal or vertical. Can work as well. Mind you, this was not photoshopped. I photographed it that way. These two devil's eyes up there, they were there in the reef. I, I, I didn't do anything. I'll talk about Photoshop later, but this was not Photoshop. Of course, you can take this picture diagonal as well, you can tilt your camera, but uh, this, uh, how do you call it in English? Um, yeah. uh, Mantishwin. Um, I mean, the two eyes, they, well, they can turn every, every, every way, you know, yeah. they, can, they can look in so many directions. Each eye already by the way, looks in three directions. I mean, you have this small band in the middle that looks straight ahead, this one looks a little bit upward, this one looks a little bit downward, and then there are two eyes, and they can be tilted in every way. So these guys do not have binocular vision, they have hexaocular vision, something like that. And they can be very precise in determining the distance of a prey, very precise. Besides that, they look in ranges of the electron and electrons spectrum, like infrared and ultraviolet, they think they see things that we never will see. Amazing these animals. And here you have uh, Asclopiga, uh, sea urchin, just a part of the uh, of the ambulacral zones, and I have tried to make it as symmetrical as possible, just to make it look nice. Well, 
you don't need to do much because these sea urchins are so amazing anyway. Or you can't get more symmetrical than that. Acetabular area, little algae. This is one centimeter across. Okay, and for the biologists amongst you, the, they grow on a little stalk. You can see them there, and that stalk that, which can grow this high is one single giant cell. Very interesting for cell biologists, this algae. Now, of course, acetabularia, green algae are not very, uh, they are not very talkative, but some animals you can shoot portraits of. And then the one who looks at your pictures relates to the subject. Now, not here. I mean, okay, nice shrimp on a nice uh, sea cucumber. Okay, this is, this is all right as a picture for, for my field guide. This shows you the, the, the species. But we can do better. Now the shrimp is a little bit coming towards you. And nice to meet you, it seems to say. And even better, like this. It's facing you, you can relate to it. This is the shrimp that is talking to you. That is something different than just being a shrimp. Who wants to be a shrimp then? Same goes, even if there are not, not eyes or, or, or things like that, goes for nudie blanks, you see it coming at you, 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 you have a relationship. See the diagonal? It's still there. Mm -hmm. okay. Or, uh, what is it? Not a soul, it's a flounder. It's a flounder. Um, flounders are ugly. They are ugly, with two eyes on one side. They start out as, as, as normal fish, you know, with eyes on either side, mm -hmm. and then in a very young stage, when they are big like that, they, they go to the bottom and lie on one side, and one side, the, the eye is touching the sand, so that's not very pleasant. And anyway, evolution has programmed them in such a way that that eye is going to, to move upwards to the other side. So here you look, look at the mouth. So this is a left side with a left eye and a right eye. So this is a left-handed fish. You have also right-handed fish with the mouth, the other way around. And uh, this per species is always the same. And well, um, frogfish, they are very nice. They're ideal subjects for photographers because they will not move away. They stay there, they sit still. So you can get a portrait of them. Uh, if you see them with this, because very often they blend in totally with the environment. I'll talk about that later. And a little uh, puffer fish. It's looking at you. Hey, who's this photographer? You interact with it. Mm -hmm. Or with a scorpion fish. And you, you see the, the diagonal that I talked to you about in the beginning. It's almost there all the time. Um, Squirrelfish, a little, uh, oh, what are they called? Gold teeth blenny or something like that. Really a shark's mouth, one would say. There's another, uh, another um, frogfish, and a triggerfish, and filefish. Portraits. Portraits, there's an octopus. Portraits are there to look pretty. They are not there for an underwater field guide. I mean, you have no idea what this animal really looks like. So this is just, hey, nice octopus, but not a good picture to explain what are the characteristics of species A or species B. This is just pretty octopus. Or um, pretty or CPR, what is it called in English? Um, cuttlefish. Helping cuttlefish, yes, thank you. And why not? I mean, they twist in, 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 in every way, these triggerfish, uh, to get bites of coral, to uh, get uh, uh, to, 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 to get to uh, sea urchins, 
or to defend the territory, they can be nasty. I'm more afraid of, 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 of these trigger fish than I am of any shark. When they defend their territory, they come at you. And they mean business. Lionfish, so that's what I call portraits. Ray. Now, of course, uh, how, how many of you show me? How many are divers? Oh, well, that's very, very uh, Ah, a little bit more. And underwater photographers? Okay, that's the two of us. No, three. Um, the, the, the tricky thing, of course, to get a picture like this is to go very slowly and breathe as little as possible because otherwise the ray is away. You just have some sand. Uh, so to get in front, you have to be patient. Anyway, to get nature pictures, you have to be patient. Here we have another example uh, of these amazing eyes of mantis shrimp. You can see the band in the middle very clearly. A lizard fish. And a stargazer. Now these are not its teeth, it looks terrifying. But these, these, these are just lumps of skin. The teeth are behind. The, the small things there, that, that's the teeth. And um, that's quite a challenge. Take pictures of the things that you don't see. Sounds silly, doesn't it? Uh, like a crab buried in the sand. <laughs> Or another crab buried in the sand. Or a lizard fish trying to be buried in the sand. Yes, you have to get used to it, but then you see it, it's there. That's because sometimes don't try to small on a perch. The smaller your aperture, the sharper your picture goes, but especially the depth of field increases. And here, fortunately, everything that is behind is out of focus. So the, uh, the fish stands out, but still it is so bottled and camouflaged and it looks so much like another sponge that it is difficult to show it. And then uh, Yes, some of the seagrass is actually a pipefish. It's nicely blending in. Isn't nature amazing? I, I love this. This one I love even more. Halimeda, tuna, uh, what is it called? Tuna, tuna wheat, something like that. Uh, that's, that's a nice algae. But actually, here is a crab. See, that's the rostrum, front part. Here are its legs, that's the hind part, and it has camouflaged itself with algae. It looks itself like an algae. There's, there's another alimida here, everywhere, everywhere, alimida. Oh, no, there's a pipefish. There's another pipefish. The eye is here, the eye is there. This is not a nice picture. But it shows how well they blend in. This is something for my field guide. <laughs> <laughs> now you can, I mean, when this guy is between the coral branches, uh, it's very hard to see. So here, it is a little bit closer to me. The coral is out of focus, so it stands out. And if you really want to show it well, you have to arrange yourself or wait till it arranges itself. That, so to get it free of its background where it, it fits in so well. And here's another one who fits in so well. We are in a, in a feather star, crinoid, and there is a little shrimp. It is exactly, here are, here are the pin pincers, and here are the eyes. It fits in amazingly. I, I would never have been able to take this picture if I hadn't had my Filipino underwater guy who showed it to me. I, I wouldn't see it. But they are, they are pretty clever. They have very good eyes. There's another one, the commercial shrimp, which lives only on fire 
uh, sea urchins. <laughs> they blend in nicely too. I mean, these are the, the what do you call them? The spines of the sea urchin. Exactly the same color, blended black and white. So that's the pair. The little one on top is the male. The big one, the boss, is the female. <laughs> I've noticed that there are quite some women in here, so I must be careful. <laughs> you are the boss, you are the boss. Um, this octopus is invisible when it closes the door. It lives inside the shell of, uh, of a bivalve, which is dead, and it uses it to, uh, to hide. And of course, when the diver comes very near, it closes the, the, the box, and then you wait, and octopuses be very curious. They slowly open. Are you still there? Oh, you are still there. And then I take the picture, and he's he is blinded by the <laughs> And then after a while, still there. <laughs> That's how it works. Or or this crab carrying a sea urchin on its back. So you don't see a crab. There is no crab. There is a sea urchin. And suddenly the sea urchin starts moving around at incredible speed. There must be someone below there. It's another amazing. But it's, it's good protection. I mean, you, you, you carry all these needles on your back. Nobody's going to eat you. <coughs> now, this is very visible. There's no, no problem there. But fish swarms are there to try to be invisible as individuals. Here the individuals are easy to make out. But maybe here it is a little bit less obvious. You get confused, you get blinded, and that is just the purpose of this fish school. So that predators will be a little bit puzzled. Which one, where is one? Where, where can I pick out one? That's, that's the purpose. So this is, this is a nice picture for a few, I think. Mm -hmm. Showing the way they behave, the way they are colored, explaining why they are that way. And then, sometimes you must realize that I see this now, and maybe if I come back tomorrow, it won't be there anymore. Or maybe it will be gone in a split second. And sometimes it can take weeks, but don't let's pass the chance to take a picture of it. What do you see here? You see one coral head, brain coral. And here you see a band of cyanobacteria, formerly called blue-green algae. And they kill the coral. This part is dead. This is just a skeleton. This part is going to die. So these blue-green algae move on slowly and will slowly kill the entire coral colony. It's called black band disease. You have white band disease, yellow band disease. It's like, it's like a school of judo. And <laughs> black belt, yellow belt. And uh, OK, this is, not, this is not fast. This is a very slow phenomenon. But it shows something that is going on. There is dynamics here in time. Of course, sharks are not there. So, have you got my picture? Shall I pose a little bit longer? They swim along, sometimes they come back, but very often sharks or any other fish, sometimes they swim by and you have to get your things right. Uh, did I put the right strength on my uh, electronic strobe that was developed by Dmitry Renikov back in the 1950s? Did I put the right diaphragm on my camera? So sometimes you know we are going to meet sharks, they will swim by at about two meters distance. So you prepare yourself for the moment so that when it happens, you are ready for it, like here. And, or here. Now this, this fish is quite common in the Mediterranean. It always lives in underwater caves. Uh, they rarely come out of their, of, the, of their holes. And they have one nasty uh, habit. When you get close, they will turn their backs. And that does not make for nice pictures. It does not make for a good speaker when you show your back. It does not make for a good photo model. Well, 
maybe that's different. But when your fish is a photo model, then it is not nice to see their backs. And here, this one shows it back and suddenly it swirls around. I got it. But that was a lucky moment. This was another lucky moment. Mediterranean again. Uh, I had one scorpion fish there and another scorpion fish there. And these were for the Mediterranean big ones, like this. And I thought, hmm, I must get a portrait of portraits. I must get a portrait of them. So I move in to sorry, sorry, I'm going to show that back again. So I move in to get the picture of this one scorpion fish. And I took one picture from a meter away and then from <coughs> half a meter away and then I got to close. And whoop, he went. Went away and landed just next to the other one. Oh. <laughs> this one I must not miss. I must take my time, I must not chase them away. You uh, you remember the Muppet Show? These two grumpy old men? <laughs> <laughs> That's them. That's them. And um, oh, this is another one. Now.